Welcome back. We are going to continue our story of Maxwell's equations via differential forms. A little sidebar here that uh, I'm more than happy to trod down. And we've already made some pretty, pretty significant progress. In the last lecture, for example, we discovered that if we were interested in understanding the divergence of a vector E, where now E is understood to be a vector in the Gibbsian sense, right? Remember, the Gibbsian sense is your classic vector analysis. We call that Gibbsian. Apparently, it's been kind of sort of the, the history of, of how our mathematical notation has come down to us has become more of a topic of conversation in recent years. And we know that Gibbs and, uh, I think, Heaviside champion this notation over some sort of quaternionic formalism of electromagnetism, which evidently Maxwell was in favor of for whatever reason. But uh, ultimately, if we start with your classic electro electric field or any classic vector field, we can get what would be called the divergence of that three-dimensional, straight-up three-dimensional vector field, which is obviously this from your classic vector analysis. That divergence ends up being equal to, as we saw in our last lecture, the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual, the Hodge dual of that, right? So it's the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of the uh, vector field understood as a vector field of um, uh, on a manifold, right? Where we now replace the the Gibbsian unit vectors x, y, and z with our partial derivative. Uh, unit vectors, partial 1, partial 2, partial 3, which is how manifolds work, right? So we understood that for, uh, uh, for where e, e ends up basically being a one form, right? So we take, we took the uh, Gibbsian form, we converted E into its equivalent one form, which we saw was very easy to do in Euclidean space because there's no, uh, there's just one-to-one -one correspondences between all of these things when you're dealing with straight up Euclidean space or in physics ensconced in Euclidean space. So once we convert the electric field to a one form, an electric field one form, notice I don't have an equal sign. This, these two really are kind of equal in the sense that we're just rewriting the unit vectors, but these two are not equal. So I have these green arrows saying it's a correspondence that we make. So we treat E as a one form, and then uh, we get our divergence of E uh, using this formula, the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of E. <laughs> and the result um, is a real number, right? The result is a real number. And then we also did the same thing for the curl, right? That is, we took the vector B, pushed it into its uh, uh, one-form version, and we discovered that if we take the, the exterior derivative of B, then we end up with a two-form, because remember, the exterior derivative raises forms by one. And we discovered we had these terms that looked awfully lo a lot like curls, and when we finally uh, uh, took the Hodge dual of that, we ended up with the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the one-form version of B gives us exactly the um, components in front of these forms uh, that match the curl. And we can just make the correspondence, I guess I would do in green here, correspondence with, um, with uh, uh, the regular vectors. And then that is our curl of B. So we have found basically ways of taking the divergence and the curl of one forms. So one question would we want to start by asking is, why would we do this? Why would we want to know the curl or the divergence of a two form, right? right? One forms are easy to understand in the sense that if we start with vectors, right, we convert them to one forms in Euclidean space, which is just a trivial correspondence, then we understand we're basically finding 
the divergence and the curl of vectors, which we understand because that is something we've learned to do in physics, right? In basic physics. It's, it's a process we need to understand. But curl and, and, and divergence have always been taught in the context of three dimensions and Euclidean physics, right? And so, and, and four vectors, right? So why would we think that something like a curl and, or, or a curl and a divergence would even be relevant to a different mathematical object that's a two-form, which is not, strictly speaking, a vector in the sense of vectors from basic physics. Why is that? And this is a really, really important point to understand, and we have to get through that. Uh, why would we hunt for an equivalent of curl and divergence for a two-form at all? And this is a very profound and I think quite confusing but extremely worthwhile point to understand. So we're going to have a quick look at why we would want to do this before we do it. Because doing it is actually very easy, but understanding the motivation is quite difficult. Okay, so to understand this, we're going to begin with a very simple Cartesian coordinate system that we have erected inside the space where all of our physics is happening. And we've selected a point for the origin, we've selected an x and y axis, and a z axis designed so it's all right-handed, your classical Cartesian coordinate system. And so this is the place where our electromagnetic physics is going on. So when we think of like electromagnetic physics, we want to think of things that are, you know, really straightforward and very obvious, like directions that particles move, directions of fields of force, things of, of that nature that we've discussed in just elementary e and m. And you can't get more fundamental than the Lorentz equation. So here I've written down the Lorentz force law. And this is the, the, when I say the arena where our physics is taking place, this is essentially the physics we're talking about. Like there's going to be a charged particle located at the origin. There's going to, and that charged particle will have uh, the charge E. I, you know what, I'm gonna change E to Q. Q is more common in this work, I think, than, than E. So Q, charge Q. And uh, the force on a particle due to the electric field is Q times E. The force on a particle due to the magnetic field is Q times the velocity of the particle crossed with B, the magnetic field. So this is sort of what we're, we're, we're dealing with when we talk about force. So this red dot here, that is our particle. And now we uh, are going to calculate the force on this particle. Right, so, well, how do we do this? Well, first let's calculate the electric part. So I'm gonna presume an electric field that exists at this point right here, and that electric field will have components one, uh, three, and say one, right? So the components of this electric field at this point is one unit in the x direction, three in the y, and one in the z, which means it's coming out of the plane a little bit. It's not illustrated well here, but you can see the numbers right there, right? And therefore, we know that this vector, right, is uh, uh, given by partial 1 plus 3 partial 2 plus partial 3, right? That's, that's the, the vector formulation uh, in the tangent space of this Euclidean flat classic electromagnetic mag universe. It's, I want to say Newtonian, but Newton, of course, didn't formulate these things. I guess it's Newtonian in the sense that you've got a force, right? So force is the mass times acceleration of the particle. So in that sense, it's very Newtonian. But here it's all just straight up Gibbs classic mathematics, right? Gibbsian uh, vectors uh, and classical simple electromagnetism. Okay, the point is, is that when we set up this, this coordinate system, that was an arbitrary choice. I had a bunch of arbitrary choices. I could have oriented it any way I wanted to. Um, I chose Cartesian instead of, say, polar or something else. But I chose the names of the x, y, and z axis so that things were right-handed, right? If x curls into y, you end up with z. z curls into x, you end up with y. If y curls into z, you end up with x using your right hand, which is another arbitrary choice. And so... It should be, of course, that, I mean, it, it stands to just fundamental reason that 
the physics, the real physics of what's happening should be completely irrelevant to the choice of the coordinate system, right? I could have done any coordinate system and nothing's going to change about how the particle actually moves. Uh, what will change is the description of how it moves, right? But not its motion itself, right? There's something intrinsic about the motion itself that we want to preserve. So let's imagine for a moment that we had chosen a different coordinate system, right? Or that we make a transformation of the coordinate system and a very simple one. We're going to, instead of making the positive x-axis go off to the right, we're going to make the positive x-axis go off to the left. Likewise, with the y, we'll, instead of going up, it'll go down. And with the z, oops, with the z-axis, it will go, uh, let's see, it'll go into the page instead of out of the page, right? So now we've literally flipped the coordinate system. So now this is the minus y-axis, the minus x-axis, and the minus z-axis. And so had we done that instead, we would notice that the right-hand rule gets a little bit messed up because now when you curl x into y with your right hand, you get minus z. And when you curl y into z, you get minus x. And when you curl z into uh, what's left, x, you get minus y. So now you have a left-handed coordinate system. You've got to use the left-handed rule. Um, or, or do you? I mean, but now you have a left-handed coordinate system is the point. And also, but what's of, more of note is that if, if you keep these components the same, e at, for uh, 1, 3, 1 components is now going to end up pointing in this direction, it's going to be coming out of the page slightly, you know, because it's got this positive one, but it's going to be pointing down and to the left, right? Because the components are always in reference to the uh, underlying coordinate system. Now, in this case, understand that, you know, this is all of space, right? We're dealing with the tangent space at this point. So when we made this exchange, when we, when we made the change that x goes to minus x, and y goes to minus y, and z goes to minus z, we've also made the change that partial x, which is equal to partial 1 the way I've written it, goes to minus partial 1. Uh, partial 2 goes to minus partial 2, and partial 3 goes to minus partial 3, right? So if I just maintain these labels like I do here and maintained these uh, component numbers, then E would have apparently flipped, right? Because now uh, partial Y is going kind of in this direction. And so 3 partial Y obviously has to go down uh, as we look at the page instead of up. So what this tells us right away is that when we reflect our entire physical space, this is a passive reflection, right? This is called passive because all I'm doing is changing the coordinate system itself. Physics, we usually use active transformations, but I think to illustrate this, passive is much better because it's so clear. If all you're doing is changing the coordinate system and leaving the, the uh, material aspects of it alone, it's much odd, more obvious that nothing really should change and what you need to do. But the point is, is if we make this passive transformation, the one I've described right here, then we have to flip the signs of all of the components in order to make this work. And there's two ways to think about it, right? I just relabel X, Y, and Z, and I keep the symbols, partial 1, partial 2, partial 3, but I change the sign of the components, so I get minus partial 1, minus 3 partial 2, minus partial 3. Or I could say, no, no, when, I've trans when I made the transformation, I also ended up transforming these basis vectors, and that's where the sign change came from, right? But regardless, I do need to know that I've got to get those component sign flipped one way or another, right? And the way we, uh, the way we remember this is we say that E is polar, right? E is a polar vector. E is a polar vector. And obviously, if I'm going to give it a name, for, it seems like, okay, it's a vector. So 
Obviously, this is true. Why do I need to call it a polar vector? And we'll see in a second, of course, that I'll remind you, hopefully, because hopefully you've seen some of this before. But there are some types of vectors where the sign doesn't change. And that's the crux of why we want to understand how to take the curl of two forms. But right now, most vectors we deal with are polar vectors. In fact, let's look at the Lorentz force law. Force, clearly, if, you, if the force, <laughs> you know, it, it, I just kind of feel silly saying this, right? But if the force is going off in this direction and I suddenly flip around the coordinate system, the force on a particle is not going to change, right? So force is polar, right? So this whole side is polar. So if, and the sides of both equal, uh, both sides of the equal sign have to transform the same way. So all of this has to be polar, right? Well, that's not a problem because we already figured out, we've just figured out that E is polar, right? So what's left? Well, we've got the velocity. Well, again, if this is your origin and you're moving in this, the particle's moving in this direction and you flip the coordinate system, well, you still want the particle moving in the same darn direction, right? So this has got to be polar, meaning you'll have to flip its components one way or another. So that leaves the question of this uh, magnetic field, right? And you might want to say, well, the magnetic field's got to be polar too, right? Because this whole thing's got to be polar. The problem, the pro this, whole, this whole right side has to be polar. The problem is this cross product here thing, right? Because the cross product has inherently a preference for right-handed systems, the way the cross product is defined. And we're flipping from a right-handed to a left-handed system. So it's not entirely obvious that the magnetic field needs to be polar. So now we're going to examine the magnetic field and see how that has to work. All right, so I'm now going to make an effort to explain the notion of a pseudo vector as I had to work through it when I was a student. And it's, you know, I, I, I got to admit, I took it a level, level probably more than I needed to. And this may be a level more than most of you care about. This is an elementary idea, the notion of a pseudo vector. And if you already know it and you're comfortable with it, fine. You may not be as comfortable with it as you, th well, you're probably as comfortable with it as you think, but you may be uh, misjudging how well you understand it. I don't know, but I'm going to try to explain it to you the way I best finally felt comfortable understanding it. So with that in mind, let, let me just begin with a regular right-handed coordinate system. X curled into Y gives you Z, Z curled into X gives you Y, and y curled into z gives you x. And these are the curl equations for the unit vectors in a typical Euclidean space, right-handed coordinate system of classical electrodynamics. I'm not even using the fancy manifold form of, of uh, the unit vectors. Um, I'm just using, this is just standard stuff from elementary electrodynamics. And this is how we define this notion here is what embodies the right-hand rule. If you execute the right-hand rule in this coordinate system, then this is how your cross products are going to turn out. All right, now I want to make a coordinate transformation from x from the unprimed system to the prime system. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm simply going to reflect each axis about the origin. And so the positive numbers of the, the positive coordinates of the prime system are going to be the, to the left of the uh, origin for the x-axis. It's going to be below the origin for the y prime axis, and it's going to be into the plane of the board for the z prime axis. So it's going to be the left for the x prime axis, and um, and likewise uh, positive for the unprimed coordinates are going to be as we just discussed. So we learned from this that if you're going to write an electric field vector, oops, if you're going to write an electric field vector in terms of the uh, unprimed system, it's going to be EX X hat plus EY Y hat plus EZ Z hat. 
And if you write the same thing in term, the same electric field in terms of the x prime system, you have to write minus e x x hat prime plus minus e y y hat prime plus minus e z z hat prime. Right, so you have to change the sign of the components, and that's because E is a polar vector. Right, that we just sort of did that. And that ensures that E will always be pointing, for example, in the correct direction, right? Because in the unprimed system, these are positive component values. In the prime system, they're negative component values. So you have to flip the sign. Because this E sub X represents the components, or E sub x, y, and z represent the components in the, pot, in the uh, original right-handed system, or in the, the, the unprimed system, I should say. So now, now let's consider the magnetic field, which of course is going to be a pseudo vector. It's not going to behave this way. It's going to behave some other way. So we begin by considering a just say a current flowing in the positive x direction of the unprimed system or the negative x direction of the prime system. But right now we'll say we're in the unprimed system and we've got this current flowing in the positive x direction. So this current that's flowing in the positive x direction is going to produce a magnetic field and that magnetic field using the right hand rule of the um, unprimed system is going to come out of the board and when something when a vector may you may remember when it comes out of the board you give it a dot right in fact uh, I guess we could actually kind of make it look like that because we're we have an oblique perspective right so now we consider a particle right here's a particle right here and we give that particle some velocity let's say uh, a velocity in the positive y direction, right? So that's the velocity of the particle. And we can now determine the force on the particle by calculating, um, we, by, we would calculate uh, v cross b, right? Where b is this blue vector coming out of the field. And calculating v cross b in our right-handed coordinate system gives us the force, and that force is in this direction. And we know that, all right, so now we're good. This is pretty elementary stuff. We've calculated the force, the Lorentz force on the particle. I guess there should be a, a Q here, right, for the charge. So now with that, uh, now we switch to the prime coordinate system. Well, in the prime coordinate system, we still want I to flow to the right. So I must be a polar vector, right? So I has to be polar. So it's components have changed sign, but we still have a polar vector, we still have a vector where the, uh, uh, where the current is flowing to the right, but to greater negative values of x prime, where it was to greater positive values of x, right? And, but now, um, in order to calculate the magnetic field, we are now in a left-handed coordinate system. So we engage the left-hand rule. And the left-hand rule tells us, oh no, we've got a magnetic field going into the page, sort of going like that, right? Now we have our velocity vector, which is still going to be a polar vector. Velocity is polar. So now the velocity is going in the uh, negative y direction, but the components of velocity have all changed sign because it's a polar vector. So now we implement the left-hand rule between this velocity vector, which is unchanged, against this magnetic field vector, which has changed, right? And now that left-hand rule gives us a force vector, which goes in this direction just as it should, because the force shouldn't change just because we passively change the coordinate system. We just have to remember that we're going from a left-handed to a right-handed coordinate system each time. So, all right, so now we see something. Now if we blow this up, we see that, wait a minute, the magnetic field did in fact change direction 
simply because of a passive coordinate transformation. It was coming out of the page and now it's going into the page. And this is a byproduct of the change from a left-handed to a right-handed coordinate system. What's tricky about this is the direction of the vector has changed, but we say that it is an axial vector, and typically we say that the components don't change. But of course the components don't change, because here, in the first case, in the right-handed system, the components of the vector were headed towards larger values of z, positive z, and when you flip, it's still headed in positive values, but now of z prime, right? So the components actually don't change, while the uh, basis vectors did in fact change. So this is altogether different behavior from the polar vectors, and it all comes back down to this sort of right-handed, left-handed, arbitrary choice of, of uh, right-hand rule and left-hand rule. And a vectors that behave, so the magnetic field we normally think of as a vector, right? We'll think of it as bx x hat plus by y hat plus bz z hat. But it's not really a vector in the sense that vectors that we are familiar with, when you flip the coordinate system, their components should flip sign. In this case, the components don't change sign, so it equals bx x prime plus by y hat prime plus bz z hat prime, right? These components are now the same. They're not, uh, there, there's no uh, additional sign change. And when those components are the same, but these unit vectors have changed direction, the vector itself appears to change direction despite the fact we've completely passively adjusted the coordinate system. So the fact that this magnetic field vector behaves this way when you reflect it under parity, the fact that that's different from how these other vectors, the force, the velocity, and the current, in this particular example, don't change, things that transform differently under coordinate changes are different things. And that's the part that we have to understand. This guy, we want it to be a vector, but we have to realize, you know what? It doesn't transform the way we expect vectors to transform. Force is clearly a vector. Velocity is clearly a vector. And they change, they have components that change sign under parity inversion. They're, the way to say it is they're negative under parity. And, but magnetic field is not. It's positive under parity. And therefore, it's not really a vector at all. It is something else. It's called a pseudo vector. And it's hard to tell because we just sort of draw little lines and give it, you know, a, 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 an origin point in, in space. And, and because it's Euclidean, we can slide these things around all over the place. And we still, there are arrows with magnitude and direction. So we still want this magnetic field to look just like a vector. But we need to understand, ah, oh, crap, if we change the coordinate system, it behaves differently. So fundamentally, fundamentally, the magnetic field is not a vector. It is a pseudo vector. And the way we've concealed that fact is we've said, well, there's two kinds of vectors in the world. There's axial vectors like the magnetic field, and there's polar vectors like the electric field, right? And these two kinds of vectors, yeah, there's just two kinds of vectors out there. Who knew? But the answer is, okay, you can get away with that. First of all, you have to memorize the fact that vectors come in two flavors, but also it's very limited and it only really works in the arena where you've defined everything to, to work, which is fine. If all you're going to do is elementary electromagnetism or engineering physics, this is perfectly good. You just have to remember this. The problem comes up is like we had the electric charge in there, right? I think I did Q for the electric charge. Well, under the parity inversion, we expect, well, that's not going to change the electric charge just because you flipped the sign of the coordinate system. The electric charge isn't going to change in any way. But there are quantities out there, 
there are quantities out there that are scalar quantities that do in fact change sign when you flip the coordinate system, right? These are called pseudoscalars. Pseudoscalar. And these are called scalars when they don't change sign. So we have scalars and we have pseudoscalars. So now pseudoscalars are totally outside the purview of, of uh, uh, classical e electrodynamics, but if we did have magnetic charges, magnetic charges would be pseudoscalars and electric charges would be regular scalars. So when we do the Lorentz force law, we write F equals Q E um, uh, plus, we got to write plus, right? Plus uh, V cross B like this. Uh, this Q, we, we, when we flip the coordinates system, we don't change the sign of Q, right? We don't change positive charge to negative charge. <clears throat> but if we were doing this with magnetic forces and we had a Lorentz force law associated with magnetic charges, then yes, it would change sign. The point is, is in physics, we do have the notion of pseudoscalars floating out there, um, but it's not relevant for what we're talking about right now, but just keep that in mind. So, so the point is, is, is that we have these things called axial and polar vectors, and the magnetic field is, in fact, a polar vector. I mean, a, an axial vector, an axial vector. Axial vector and pseudo vector are synonymous, right? These are, the, these are meant to be the same thing. Okay, so now, now that we know that, what does this have to do with the cross product of a two form? So let's discuss that now. So we begin by looking at this picture for three-dimensional space of the different uh, vector spaces for the various forms, the vector space of all the one forms, vector space of all the two forms, three forms, and zero forms. Now, with three dimensions, it's considerably smaller than the one for, we looked at for four dimensions, which was uh, this one you may remember from a previous lecture where we did one forms, two forms, three forms, and four forms, right? So we lose the fourth one. We cut down a dimension. I guess we get rid of this x zeros, and uh, we just live with the three dimensions, right? So the more dimensions you have in your space, the more one form basis vectors there are, and the larger the dimensionality of, of the space. And, uh, but what's important to understand is that the dimensionality of the one forms is equal to the dimensionality of the n minus one forms, where n is the total number of dimensions of the space. So in our case here, n is four, right? There's four dimensions. So the one forms have is a four-dimensional vector space, and the four minus one forms, or the three forms, is also a four-dimensional vector space. Now what we're doing is we're playing around in three dimensions. So we have, in our case, n equals three. So we have three dimensions for one forms, and three minus ones are the two forms, but there's also three dimensions for the two forms. So these are two, these are both three-dimensional vector spaces. So the question now is, well, if they're both three-dimensional vector spaces, why are we automatically going to this one for our B, our electric and magnetic vector fields? We call them vector fields, and we know that, okay, so that's probably the reason, right? We say, oh, these guys, well, they're vector fields. I know they're vector fields because I've studied them that way, and they've always called them vector fields. So what we naturally tend to do is we tend to say, uh, what do we tend to say? We tend to say, um, well, if E is a vector field, then E equals E1 partial 1 plus E2 partial 2 plus E3 partial 3. And then we immediately convert this into it's one form version because it's free. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence for that. And we're sort of studying the nature of forms, right? So we're going to convert this into the obvious dual one form. This is the dual form. So we go E1 
dx1 plus e2 dx2 plus e3 dx3. So because e is a vector, right, this is what we do. And over here, we have to maybe give e a slightly different symbol because now it's a form. So maybe I will put a line underneath it or something like that. So when we did that for e, we said, well, b is a vector too, right? So why can't I write b vector, and then I just do the exact same thing, exactly like this, right? I just write b the same way, and I find b's one form version the same way. Well, so this is what we naturally tend to do because we want to think of b as a vector, but now we know that it's not really a vector, it's a pseudo vector, right? So what's interesting is because we have this rich structure of forms, we can actually choose whether we want our E and B fields to be represented by one forms or by two forms. And we choose the one that is most appropriate. And so how do we figure out which one is the most appropriate? Well, we use our coordinate transformations and figure out which one of these actually transforms the right way. Do, how do one forms trans, transform under a change of basis, uh, a, a change of basis, a parity inversion, right? A full reflection about the origin. And how do two forms transform about a full reflection about the origin? So it's not too hard to investigate how that works. Because what we're going to write is we're going to say, okay, x1 is going to go to uh, x1 prime x2 is going to go to x2 prime, and x3 is going to go to x3 prime, right? That's the transformation. And we now we also know that we're doing a parity inversion. So I can say that x1 actually equals minus x1 prime. x2 actually equals minus x2 prime, and x3 equals minus x3 prime which is great, and now I can also understand that the forms are going to transform exactly the same way. dx1 is going to go to dx1 prime with a minus sign. Likewise, dx2 is going to go to minus dx2 prime, and dx3 is going to go to minus dx3 prime. So, now, I execute this substitution right into the E field. And I'm going to get that the E field in the prime frame, the E field, e, the E one form field is going to be given by this expression right here. I just made these substitutions dx1 with minus dx1, dx2 minus dx2, dx3 minus dx3, just like that. And the minus signs all will come out, and what we'll end up with is that the prime form field is minus E1 dx1 prime minus E2 dx2 prime minus E3 dx3 prime, which is exactly what we want because we know that in the new basis system, the components in the old basis system, which are E1, E2, and E3, have to change sign. And there they do. They change sign straight up. Now the problem, of course, is that when we do this, we'll get the same result for the magnetic field. So we're going to end up with B prime, where the B prime also has a change of sign. But we know that B prime does not change sign because B is a pseudo vector. This is fine for a polar vector. So we can conclude that a polar vector should, in fact, be a one form, right? So polar vectors are one form. So I can actually just write down E should be a one form because it transforms the right way. Well, look what would happen if instead of, of making B a one form, we made B a two form. What would happen? if we wrote b prime down as a two form. 
So I'll just draw, you know, B with two lines under it, meaning it's B is now a two form, right? That's sort of my notation. And now I say, okay, it's got con components B1, B2, and 3. And these are the three basis vectors, right? This is a one basis vector, two basis vectors, three basis vectors. That's all the basis vectors in the, uh, uh, in the space of two forms. And the components are just B1, B2, B3. Now, in principle, this probably is best to write down as B, um, instead of uh, B1, you might write it down as B23, right? Something like that. Uh, let me change this up a bit. Um, B23, uh, and then this one here would be B31, and then this last one would be, let's see, B12, something like that. But regardless, it's still the component, these are just still the components of these three basis vectors. But now if I make my substitution for dx2 and dx3 as minus dx2 prime, right, and minus dx3 prime, and likewise for dx3, dx1, minus dx3 prime, minus dx1 prime, and dx1, dx2 as minus dx1 prime and minus dx2 prime. Now look at this miracle that happens. The negative signs cancel out. And what you end up with is the transformed vector, right, which is going to be, uh, let me change back to black here. It's going to be b prime to form. And if you look at it, we now are in the primed system, but notice that the coefficients haven't changed. The components are have not changed sign, which is exactly the behavior we would expect for a pseudo vector. This is a pseudo vector, pseudo vector. So now we have some understanding of this we have some insight, right? We have some insight. Here we had this sort of arbitrary distinction between two kinds of vectors, this B-type vector and the electric field vector, which was, you know, this electric field vector. And uh, we, we noticed that, hey, you know, there's just two different types of vectors. They transform different, and I just got to kind of keep track of the... Uh, fact that the components don't change sign for B and they do change sign for E, for the electric field, and polar and axial. So I, I, I sort of take note of it and I keep track of it that way. But now what I realize is, no, 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 what's going on really is the electric field really lives in this world of one forms and the magnetic field lives in this world of two forms. And these things have all the transformation properties built in. So the magnetic field is just a different type of mathematical object. And now we are putting it really in its right place. We're not doing some kind of bookkeeping trick. We're actually understanding this in the right way. And the right way is as a two form. So now that we're going to understand the magnetic field as a, as a two form, now we have to understand, well, heck, I need to know how to calculate the curl of the magnetic field because I know that the curl of the magnetic field, this is part of Maxwell's equations. So in order to understand how to do the curl of a magnetic field, uh, I have to now understand what does it mean to take the curl of this kind of object, of a two-form. Because I know how to take the curl of a vector. We've already demonstrated that. The curl of a vector, you convert to a one-form. Now we know how to do curls of one-forms. But I, I need to know how to do the divergence of the vector B. So I need to find the equivalent expressions for this in terms of what B really is, which is a two-form, right? I need to find what is the what do I do in the world of forms to mimic these properties in Maxwell's equations? Because now I'm going to not think of, because when I look at Maxwell's equations, I'm thinking of B as a vector in the old sense. It is a 
pseudo vector, not a vector, but well, I could say it's an axial vector, but I usually say it's a vector and then I just have to remember, oh, it's an axial vector. But now I'm going to say, no, B is a two form. So I have to understand how to, under to uh, understand curls and divergences of two forms. So that's the motivation. All that stuff I just set up to here, which has been probably over a half an hour of talking, is just the motivation. Because we are now going to think of the magnetic field as a two form. And now we have to understand what does it mean? How do we transform these vector curls and vector divergences into two form language? So that is our, our final part of today's lesson. So the good news is this last part is actually very, very easy. The first thing is we realize, okay, we're dispensing with this idea that the magnetic field vector we're going to immediately write as a uh, vector and as a one form. Instead, we are going to express the magnetic field, maybe I need to put little two little lines underneath, as a two form, right? We're going to choose a two form to represent the magnetic field. So now we still need to take the curl and divergence, as I said a moment ago. So we know how to take the divergence of a one form, right? The divergence of a one form. Let's work on the divergence first. So we know how to take the divergence of the one form because the divergence of a one form is the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of some one form. And as you can see, inside this of some one form, I've put the Hodge dual of B, but B is now a two form, remember, because we are now calling B a two form. So, so uh, what we're doing is I'm substituting in for this one form the Hodge dual of our two form, and I'm hoping this will work. Because if it does work, it's very easy because the Hodge dual of the Hodge dual is, th this is an invert inverse of each other, right? You, if you take the Hodge dual of a Hodge dual, you get back the original thing. So this divergence expression for the two form B is just the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the two form. Now, the question is, is I'm speculating, right? Because I've, I've just uh, written this down and I'm saying, well, I, I know how to take the divergence of a one form, so if I can turn this into a one form, take the divergence of that, maybe this all works. So let's check. Let's calculate the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the two form uh, uh, version of the magnetic field. And the, um, well, first I need to calculate the exterior derivative, right? We just ignore this for right now. I need to calculate the exterior derivative of the two form. And that's not hard, because remember, the exterior derivative of a two form is a three form, right? And that's already making me feel good, because the Hodge dual of a three form, right, when I take this guy and I Hodge dual the three form, I'm going to get a zero form, which is a scalar, and the divergence is a scalar. So I'm in the right zone. So I do this calculation, the exterior derivative of my two form, uh, magnetic field two form, which I'm showing by underlining because there's really, I'm running out of ways of showing these things. And um, that property, that, po that I, we've already done several demonstrations of how to take the exterior derivative of something, but it's not very tough. It's a sum. And uh, the only surviving terms are partial one B1 uh, of dx1 wedge dx2 wedge dx3, partial 2 B2 of dx2 dx3 wedge dx1, partial 3 B3 dx3 wedge dx1 wedge dx2. And if you shuffle this stuff around, you flip, you, the 1, 2, 3 is what we want. This is the basis vector of the three-form vector space, which is one-dimensional. So this basis vector here is, is off. I have to flip dx1 and dx3, and then flip dx1 and dx2. That's two flips, so there's no sign change. So this can be immediately just substituted for dx1, dx2, dx3 wedged. And this one, uh, likewise, I flip the 1 and 3, and then I flip the 2 and 3, so I get no sign change there either. And I end up with partial 1b1, partial 2b2, plus partial 3b3, 
with dx1, dx2, dx3 as our basis vector, which is, which is exactly the divergence, right? This is the divergence of the regular vector field uh, from classical vector analysis. And then this makes it a three form. So it's not a scalar, it's actually a three form. In fact, it's a pseudo scalar, isn't it? Because if we did, if you changed these coordinates, if you did a parity inversion, you would be left over with a sign change. So it's interesting. This is actually, as it's written, is a pseudo scalar, which is something I told you doesn't show up much, but it, it is right here. Right here, you see it. Uh, this is a genuine pseudo scalar. So, um, but we're going to take the Hodge dual of this thing, right? We're taking the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative, and when you do that, this guy gets replaced with just the number one, because the Hodge dual of the um, of the single one-dimensional three-form basis vector is just the number one. And there you have it. So now it so it checks out. So it checks out that the divergence of a two-form is given as the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the two-form. Likewise, the curl of a one-form was the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the one-form. So if I substitute in the Hodge dual of our, of our magnetic field two-form, then what do I end up with? I end up with the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of the two form. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. So what we end up seeing is that the divergence of a one form and the curl of a two form are actually given by the same expression. The Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of the one form gives you the divergence of the one form. It corresponds with the divergence of the one form. And the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of the two form gives you the curl of uh, the curl of a vector, right? I'm sorry. This gives you the divergence of a vector, and this gives you the equivalent of the curl of a vector. So that's cool. Um, and then the divergence of a two form, right? Uh, let's see. The divergence of a two form. Uh, let me make sure I say this correctly. The curl of a one form, right? The curl of a one form is the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the one form. And that corresponds to the curl of some vector in our elementary system. And that is equal to, or that has the same structure. I shouldn't say it's equal to, but it has the same structure as the divergence of a two form, right? We just learned that the divergence of a two form was the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the two form, which corresponds to the divergence of some vector field. So that's kind of nice because now we can see that right away we can write down this Maxwell's equations, the divergence of the electric field. We treat the electric field like a one form. Well, what's the divergence of a one form? See, it's the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of your one form. So this now is the, the differential forms version of this of the divergence uh, Maxwell's of the sourceful Maxwell equation. Likewise, the curl, the curl of the magnetic field. Um, uh, let's see. Well, let me let me do the divergence of the magnetic field because that's much easier. The magnetic field we're now going to treat as a two form. So now we know that this divergence expression is equivalent to, in the form language as the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the magnetic field two form equals zero. So these two are very, very easy to see. And um, as long as we're dealing with the static case with no sources, right? So no sources means there's no current and it's static, so the E field isn't changing. Then I can write the curl of the magnetic field two form is the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of our magnetic field two form, right? That's the curl equation, which would have been, uh, which is the same structure as a divergence equation of a one form. And likewise, in the static case where dBdt is zero, 
I now get the, uh, the curl of a one form because E is a one form. Uh, I get the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of E equals zero. So these now, I've now converted Maxwell's equations, at least in the static case, in the static case, to the language of forms. Very nice, very nice. And that's where we're going to stop for now. And in the next lesson, we're going to sort of tidy this up uh, uh, even more using uh, yet more conventions and more notation. But this is the key point. The key point now is we have organically discovered that the magnetic field vector, as written in standard Maxwell notation language from your standard E&M textbooks, that language of magnetic field as a vector is actually... I'm going to go ahead and say it. It's just wrong. Um, it's wrong in the sense that it doesn't capture the... the uh, there's a mathematical piece of machinery out there that does so much a better job capturing what it actually is. It captures that transformation rule, for example. And it also allows us to tighten things up uh, far more, as we'll see in the next lesson. But So now we are no longer talking about the magnetic field vector. We're talking about the magnetic field two-form. We're not talking about the electric field vector. We're talking about the electric field one form. And uh, now we have these uh, form equations uh, as, as necessary. Now, there's no magnetic charges. If there were magnetic charges, they'd be down here, right? But there aren't any. And, uh, but we do leave the source in up here. It's easy enough to leave the source uh, for this Maxwell's equation. But down here, if we said it was static we would get rid of this and we would leave this source term in and then we would say that uh, this term here, the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of the Hodge dual of the magnetic field two form equals mu zero j. Um, if we uh, got rid of this uh, time dependence or, or this uh, a non-static term. Okay, so in the next lesson, we'll try to tighten this up a little further even. Uh, see you next time. Oops, I guess uh, I should be erasing this because that is now a one form, not a vector.